Okay. Uh, do you have any questions for me before I... Um, well, uh, am, am I under suspicion? I'm the one who called in the... Let's not get ahead of ourselves, Mr. Kaczynski. Right now, we're just trying to piece together what happened. No one's being accused of anything. Okay. Okay. I mean, if this is because of the car, I know it's not registered. It's just that I can explain... You'll have the chance to do that, Mr. Kaczynski. If you help us understand what happened today, it'll go a long way with the judge later. You understand? Okay. Okay. I get it. I'll, I'll tell you everything. It's just... I'm still in shock, you know? Of course. That's perfectly understandable. Can I get you something? Coffee? No. No, that won't be necessary. Let's just get this over with. Right, then. How did you get to Grenza? Well, um... I decided to go on a road trip. And why did you do that? I haven't been in the best place lately. Not in best place. And what place would that be, Mr. Kaczynski? Not an actual place, officer. You know, I, I haven't been doing that well emotionally. I see. Looking for a release of some kind? Yes. No. I. Well, my fiancé recently called off our engagement, said I'd become distant from everything and everyone, including her, that I was all up in my head. But if that's true, it's not my fault. She doesn't understand. I've been working on a PhD in which, which I... Which university? Why does that matter? Sorry. It's just... Why are we talking about me anyway? Didn't they tell you what I saw? It was horrible. They were falling from the building, one after the other, coming to the window, and then... I can't get the sound of them hitting the pavement out of my head. It was like a large hand slapping the cement, and then once they started to... We're aware of the situation, Mr. Kaczynski. I need you to stay on topic. Can you do that? Of course. The road trip? Right. I was uh, eating a frozen dinner and feeling pretty depressed. I decided right then, on a whim, that I needed to leave, just get away from it all, clear my head. I drove down to Walmart and you know, filled my trunk up with random stuff, supplies, you know. Beef jerky, a tent, a few jugs of water. Afterwards, I sat in my car wondering where to go. I, I punched in small towns in West Virginia. You punched in? So you weren't using Google Maps? Right. Look, I already admitted this to the other officer. I never got the mind phone, okay? Call me a conspiracy theorist. But look... Why West Virginia? I have no idea. It's, it's mid-October. I wanted to go somewhere where the trees are beautiful. West Virginia is the first state that came to mind. So how did you even find out about Grenza? An old GPS, 50 years old at least. Still works, God knows how. Old GPS... Still working. You're aware that this car of yours wouldn't have made it to Grenza if it were driverless and registered. You're aware of this? Lucky me, I guess. When did you modify it? What? The car, Mr. Kaczynski. Listen, like I said before, if you help us now, it'll go a long way to helping you later. I... Okay. We'll come back to the car. How long did it take you to get to Grenza? Drive straight through? Ten hours or so. Yeah, I did. Okay, continue, and please be as thorough as possible. I arrived at the outskirts of the town. I saw run-down roads and all that. Looked like the locals had tried to maintain them, but not very well. It's as remote a place as I've ever been. Deep in the mountains, just like I, I, I wanted. The sun was beginning to rise, and there was this uh, thick blanket of fog all around me. I could barely make out my surroundings. As I was approaching the town limits, something very strange happened. Um, a yellow school bus came up close behind me, wanting me to move over for it to pass. Unregistered? Why do we keep coming back to registration questions? Is that what this is all about? Unregistered vehicles? Just trying to get all the facts, Mr. Kaczynski. Registered or unregistered? Unregistered. Ancient, really. I moved over a bit, 
on the two-lane road, thinking it now had enough room. But the driver flashed his lights and blared his horn. I was so startled that I, I put my blinker on and pulled over to the side of the road. I was thinking, you know, surely now the bus has enough room to pass, you know? In my rearview mirror, I noticed that there were more school buses following us. Eight, I think. They're all driving fairly fast. I wound down my window to get a better look as they passed me. The buses weren't filled with children like you'd expect, but with adults and some older people. They all looked sad, really grave, and not well-dressed. I had the impression these were poor people. And this was Tuesday. At what time? About 6 a.m. or thereabouts. Okay, then what happened? After you saw the buses? Well, after the taillights of the last bus had dissolved into the fog, I turned back onto the road. And ten minutes later, I was in Grenza. The place was like a ghost town, very run down, no signs of life at first. The buses must have just rolled through and kept on going. I never saw them again. I drove to the main street and then parked and got out. I wanted coffee, and there just happened to be a coffee shop open on the, the main street. How did you know it was the main street? The GPS had listed several shops, and I mean, the town is very run down, you know. The only shop open. <laughs> if I remember correctly, was that coffee shop. But the road to it was closed. So I I parked just down the road, off the main street, and I I walked to the coffee shop. What do you mean, closed? There were barricades and orange and white signs that said, road closed. And oddly, there was a a hand-painted banner hanging on the barricades that said, thank you for your service. I just assumed there was some kind of festival going on that night, so... The town had shut down the main road. I made my way to the coffee shop on foot. I, I, I started to feel somewhat uneasy. As I said, the place was pretty run down. A lot of the stores were boarded up, some as if they'd been so for years. I found my way by the, you know, the faint glow that came from the windows of the coffee shop. And then... And then, oh God, it was horrible. What was? What did you see? What I saw and what I heard, it was the hearing that was the worst part. As I approached the coffee shop, there was this tall building in front of me on the other side of the road, about 15 stories tall. And somewhere around the 10th floor, a head emerged from one of the windows. There was no screen on it, you know. For some reason, I wondered if the man was going to jump. And then he did. And he hit the ground with a terrible slapping, cracking sound. I was stunned. I've been around death a great deal, and I've never witnessed a suicide. As soon as I got a hold of myself, I realized I better go for help. I was torn between running over to see if he was still alive. I mean, there was no way he was and turning into the coffee shop for help. That's when I saw another head emerge, a bald head this time. I assumed he too had witnessed the jump from inside the building and was checking on the man below, or maybe it it crossed my mind he had pushed him. And just as this thought occurred to me, the bald man climbed halfway out the window and then dropped to the ground. He dropped more than jumped. Head first, too. Again, I heard the slap on the pavement. You know, I, I raised my hand to my mouth in disbelief. And a, a large bodied woman of, of about 60 did the same thing, climbing out the window. She barely fit through it. And, and then letting herself drop head first, facing me, she was. She had this long black skirt, it billowed in the wind for a second before she hit the cement. The horror of the scene was compounded by the silence preceding each slap on the pavement. None of these people made a sound as they fell. No screaming or crying that I could make out. People just kept falling from that window like they were on some kind of assembly line of death. These people, could they have been the same ones you saw in the 
unregistered school buses. They were, in fact. That's what the guy said. What guy? The social worker guy. That's what the people in the coffee shop called him. He told me his name was Jack. Jack what? That was it, just Jack. And how did you meet this Jack? I noticed there was a crowd in the coffee shop talking and cheering. The, the, the festiveness was so out of keeping with what I had seen that I walked over to the shop half in a daze at first. I thought maybe they hadn't seen, you know, maybe the noise was for some sports thing they were all watching. I ran into the shop and I, I, I shouted, hey, people are dying out here. The mood in the room soured immediately, but it wasn't because of what I said. It was because of me. They looked terrified of me. And many of them backed away. I could hear some whispering, asking who I was, wondering where I'd come from. They weren't aware of the people falling outside? Sure they were. The window of the place was right across the street from the building, and, and this growing pile of bodies. The cheering and the laughter I'd heard was precisely because they were watching people die, like at a sporting event or something. A lot of people in the room were even jostling to get a better look. Okay, and then what happened? Well, I walked quickly to the counter. Again, people were moving away from me in fear, like I had some sort of disease. I told the barista that people were dying out there and that he should call the police. He got this super weird smile on his face, like he was afraid of me, but he was trying to play it cool. He rang a little metal bell on the counter, never broke eye contact. The, the crowd of people had turned their attention away from the suicides and were now looking directly at me. It was at that point that I met Jack. Was he one of the crowd in the coffee shop? I don't know. I, I felt a hand on my shoulder, so I turned around and there he was. He looked me straight in the eye and I, I felt my panic lessen. There was something calming about him. He told everyone in the shop that everything was fine and that I was a friend of his and not one of the walking people. That's what he said, walking people. I still have no idea what the hell that means. He told the crowd he'd explain later. I remember, even as he said these things and held everyone's attention, three more bodies hit the ground outside. I could see them through the windows. But worse, I could he I hear them. No one seemed to care. After Jack spoke, the people turned their attention back to the carnage outside and resumed their chatter. Jack led me upstairs to the second floor. I could look through the window down at the street below. The bodies were really starting to pile up. Blood was filling the sidewalk. I felt sick like I was going to vomit and I started trembling uncontrollably. I said, stop them. Can't you stop them? as if this Jack could really do anything. But then he did. He opened the window and he whistled. A woman about to jump stepped back inside and you know, the window of this tall building slid shut. Jack looked at me and he lifted his palms up as if to say, satisfied. And then we just talked. And this Jack, as you call him, what did he look like? Uh, well, he was short, just over five feet, came up to about my shoulder. Blonde, sandy hair, mustache, boots, brown pants, green eyes. And what I did think. the two of you talk about? And again, please be as thorough as you can. Well, he got real serious at first and asked when the others were coming. I told him I didn't know what he was talking about, and he said to stop bullshitting him. I, I then told him everything I told you about how I ended up in Grenza, you know, the unregistered car, wanting to get away from things. He seemed skeptical at first, and then I asked where the police were. He looked at me with some disbelief, and then he gave me a surprised laugh. He told me the police had been abolished years ago, that Grenza wasn't on any maps, that the locals liked it that way. And what about the suicides? What about the people in the shop cheering their deaths? He didn't call them suicides. He called them patriots. Said that the people downstairs had come to pay their respects. 
Then he got all philosophical on me, preachy, you know. Some sort of cult leader, do you think? What did he say? Please, again, be detailed. He said that there are five fundamental questions we ask ourselves. God, what were they? Um, right, first, where do we come from? We as in humanity, you know, collectively and individually. Second, who are we? Third, why are we here? Fourth, how should we live? And fifth, and finally, where are we going? He said that there are dogmatic answers to each of these questions, that the refusal to acknowledge those answers is what has held human communities back. And then he asked me if I believed in God. I said I wasn't sure. He said that was okay. And he started talking about religion, said that religion is just a lens through which people try to make sense of the world. He compared it to those lenses in an optometrist's office. You know, the ones where they, they, they click the thing and they ask if it's more clear or more blurry. He said religion was like that, a way for people to try to make sense of the world. An overarching narrative, that's what he called it. A narrative into which the brutality and meaninglessness of life makes sense. In the end, though, he said, we only have two options. Face the chaos of reality with courage or use the lens of religion to impose a sort of artificial order. Um, these fundamental questions of his and God, I'm afraid to ask, but did he give answers to them? He did, yeah. I was too afraid, honestly, to interrupt or disagree with him. He said that all of us individually and collectively have been coughed into existence by a blind cosmic process that did not have us in mind, that we were merely an accidental byproduct of nature, the end result of time plus matter plus chance. And he got up and told me to follow him. There was a, um, a library of sorts in the next room. What do you mean library? A library, an old-fashioned bookshelf, paper books. Uh, about how many books? Books? I, I don't know. Hundreds? Hundreds. And this was where exactly? On the second floor of the coffee shop? Right. He pointed at the bookshelf and said how these people, he mentioned a few, uh, Margaret Sanger, Alfred Kinsey, Martin Luther King Jr., there were others too, but I forget. He said that they all believed they'd been put here for a purpose. He said it mockingly, you know, like they were all idiots. I spoke up at that point. I, I, don't, I don't know why, but I said maybe they were. <laughs> he, he spun around and he asked in this tone that was far too conciliatory, as if he were hiding his rage. He said, and how could that be? He was smiling as he said it. He said, how could that be? If the universe is one meaningless outworking of mindless matter, how could it be the case that man has objective meaning? He said that whatever meaning man ascribes to himself, no matter how noble it might seem to us, it's merely a self-imposed delusion to get him through the long days and the longer nights. And the Patriots, did he explain why those people were throwing themselves to their deaths? Yes, he said they were heroes. For jumping to their deaths? Yes for jumping to their deaths. We walked back over to the room we'd first entered and sat down. There were two bigger guys there at this point, must have come in while we were in the next room. Scary looking guys. Security, I thought. Uh, Jack asked if I wanted a coffee. I said yes. I, I tried buddying up to him, I guess. I, I thought if we got along, if I listened to his bullshit ramblings and he knew I wasn't some sort of undercover police thing, that he'd eventually let me go. He nodded at one of the men, and he went downstairs. A few minutes later, he was back with the coffee. It tasted weird, but I drank it. Jack lit a cigarette, and he asked me what I thought the good life was. I told him I didn't know what he meant. He asked me my views on morality, how we should live, that sort of thing. I told him we should at the very least avoid harming people that we should, whenever possible, do good. He leaned back in his chair and said, that's fine. 
That's fine, but what if many wanted to harm, wanted to rape, wanted to be cruel? He said, what's to stop him? Why shouldn't he? And then he, he pointed at me and said, because you say he shouldn't? What authority do you have over him? I said something about society condemning it, and he said that society was just a group of individuals, and if individuals had no moral authority over man, then neither would a group of them, however large. I asked what all this had to do with those people out there falling to their deaths. I asked how that benefited Grenza. He said, more resources, no waste, an end to substance abuse and poverty and trying to eke out one more hour of a life that is done. He said that allowing these men and women to sacrifice themselves honors them and memorializes their love for their people, that each of their names would be on the monument. What monument? He pointed towards the window and said the citizens of Grenza were soon going to construct it in, in, in the place the patriots had made the ultimate sacrifice. He told me to look at it this way. He said, those people throwing themselves to their deaths, which of them could live forever if they wanted to? I said, none. He said, do you see my point? He said, we're all headed to the grave, not just individually, but collectively as a species. He asked if I had ever read The Time Traveler. I said, no. He said that as the universe expands, it uses up more and more energy, and that there will come a time when it, too, will die. And then he got real serious. He, he, he stood up and came over to me. He bent down, whispered in my ear. He said, this is the horror of modern man. Because he comes from nothing and ends in nothing, he is nothing. Then he stood up and laughed. He said, if the Patriots decide to sacrifice themselves for the good people of Grenza instead of dying hopelessly and without courage just a decade or two from now, that is their decision and they should be honored for it. He told me to finish my coffee and that I'd soon understand. He told me I have no reason to go on living, that I wasn't a contributor but a taker. He asked, who will miss me? And said, wouldn't it be better to be forever celebrated by the good people of Grenza? for my patriotism. Did he drug you? No, I think he was trying to. Oh, what's the use now you already know? I think they found a way to override a man's mind phone. They assumed I had one, but I don't, so I just played along. I looked down at the floor, and then one of the men picked me up from under my arm, and I followed him down the stairs and through the crowd. Jack followed behind. He was yelling, We have another patriot! And the crowd cheered and people began patting me on the shoulder as I was escorted out of the shop. I'm pretty sure they were all convinced I'd been brainwashed. I'm sure of it. Anyway, I walked across the street with this man who never let go of my arm. We walked by the pile of corpses. Just at that moment, another fell and then another. You know, I winced each time a body hit the ground. Some of the jumpers were landing on top of previous jumpers. It, that was another kind of sound, a heavy, dull bruising sound. I couldn't see any escape. The man led me into the front entrance of the building. From inside, the stench of urine and decay came at me. He pushed me toward the stairway and then he walked away. And the bodies kept falling. What did you see when you got inside? There was a line of men and women on the staircase. I had no idea what to do. If I left by the door I came in through, they'd see me. So I took my place in line. We rose a step at a time, regularly, and I knew that with each step, a place had been made at the top by someone dropping from the window. I looked real close at the people with me. They weren't drugged or zombie-like. As I'd expected, they were chatting idly about things they'd seen on TV and how the weather had been so nice lately. No one really noticed me, though the man in front of me did turn and smile. And the line kept moving upward. When I arrived on the second floor, I decided to take my chances. 
I excused myself quietly from the line and I headed down a hallway and then into a side room with open windows. I could see the coffee shop across the street. I looked down for a minute. Better to jump here, I thought, with a chance of survival than face certain death imitating the Patriots. I squeezed out. I, I clung to the lintel for a minute, lowering myself as much as possible. And then I let go. A bush broke my fall. And then I ran, like a wild man I ran. I was sure someone had seen me jump and was chasing after me. But there wasn't anyone. After a while, I slowed down and I found my way back to my car. Somehow my shaking fingers got my keys into the ignition and then I, I, I drove. Never stopped until I reached the next city in the diner where I asked for someone to call the police. They knew right away just by me asking that I wasn't registered. But I didn't care at that point. The horrible things I had seen and heard were more important than any crimes I may have committed. And you haven't spoken with anyone else about what you saw in Grenza, are you sure? No, no one. Like I said, they called you from the diner, and the next thing I knew I was being interrogated by your people. Um, these eight unregistered school buses you saw, are you sure you never saw them again? What? No. Hell, does it matter? Well, thank you, Mr. Kaczynski. Yeah, sure. Where are you going? Pascal Kaczynski. What are you... You are under arrest for being Wait. unregistered. What the hell are you talking possession about? possession of an unregistered car. And Why are you putting the cuffs on Officer me? Officer Bradbury will Detective. escort you to the squad car. Bradbury, make sure you do your paperwork on this one. Schedule the implantation immediately. Tell Jack we're going to need to see those school buses.